Let's talk about syntax rules. Syntax rules in mumps are very strict. You must follow them. If you don't, you get some very bizarre results sometimes. If a line begins with a label, the label must be in column one. It can't be anywhere else. After the label, there must be at least one blank or a tab uh, before the first command word. If there's no label, column one must be a blank. There may be additional blanks before the first command word. That's your option. Uh, on the line itself, the line will be made up of one or more commands. A command, or most of the commands, can be post-conditionalized. Now, a post-conditional is colon followed by an expression. So if I have the, the, com the command set, I could have a post-conditional colon x equals y. We've seen that before. There can be no blank between the word, the last letter of the word set and the colon, and no blanks in the expression except if they're in double-quoted strings. After the last letter of the command and the first letter of the argument, commands have arguments, there must be at least one blank. Uh, the arguments themselves have no embedded blanks unless they're in double-quoted strings. If there are multiple commands on a line, after the last argument of a command, there must be at least one blank before the first letter of the next command. Now, there's an exception to that, and the exception deals with commands that have no arguments. The quit command has no arguments. The um, else command has no arguments. And in some cases, the if command can have no arguments. The do command, in many cases, has no arguments. If a command has no arguments, and it is not the last command on the line, there must be two blanks, two blanks between the last letter of the command word and the first letter of the next command. The two blanks signify to the interpreter or the compiler that there, is no, there are no arguments. Arguments are optional in some cases, and sometimes they indicate which command you're doing. The halt command uh, can be abbreviated as H, and so can the hang command. The difference is one has an argument and the other one doesn't. Uh, semicolon uh, re results in the remainder of the line being taken as, as comments. Now, the semicolon must appear in a place where a command word is legal, with the exception that the semicolon may appear in column one. If semicolon appears in column one, the remainder of the line is a comment. If semicolon appears el other elsewhere, it also means the remainder of the line uh, on which there may have been some other things. So if I have um, a command, a line that has you know one or more blanks set, i is equal to j, something like that, I need one space and then I can put a semicolon. I can't put the semicolon right after the letter j. Okay, that would be interpreted as part of the, of the argument. You have to have a blank after the argument in order to delimit the argument. Uh, there are some non-standard rules for my version of, of mumps in that you can use a pound sign and double slashes to indicate comment. Pound sign in column one means the line is a comment. This is similar to bash uh, for Linux. And two forward slashes make the remainder of the line uh, a comment. And again, they must appear in a place where a command word is legal. Uh, also, with the compiler version of mine, a plus sign indicates that the remainder of the line is embedded C, C++ code. Anyway, I won't dwell on that. Um, here's some examples. We see, first of all, label 1, a blank, or a tab, I can't tell, set A is equal to 123. The next line here, there's no, there's no label, and we have one or more blanks before the, uh, before the actual command. The next line here, we have two commands. The first command is set A is equal to 123, and the second one is set B equal to one, uh, 345. You notice there's a blank between the three and the letter set, the letter S of the second set. Then the next one here, we have a post-conditional, which is set. Now the post-conditional is if I is equal to J, A equal to 123. So A will receive the value 123 if I is equal to j. Otherwise, no. It will move on, in this case, since it's nothing else in the line, it'll move to the next line. This is a comment which encumbers, the, the next one here is a standard comment. The co semicolon is in the first column. The remainder of the line is taken as a, as a comment. The next, uh, next one here shows the set 120, uh, a equal to 123, a space, semicolon, and then a comment. That's just, those are the standard ways of doing comments. You see in the blue text here, 
uh, using the double slash in mine you see the plus sign in column one you see the uh, which means the remainder of the line is c c plus plus and you also see the pound sign in column one indicating the remainder remainder of the line is a comment I, the pound sign was adopted because it is used so much in bash scripting here are some errors um the first one here the set begins in column one that'll be interpreted as a label and then it'll look at the a and try to figure out what command you're using not a good idea the next one here the label is indented it's not in column one it'll try to interpret label as a command not successfully the next one here is somebody tried to get real neat and they put blanks between the um, variables and uh, constants and the operators no blanks are allowed you do that it won't work um, the next one here is uh, a halt command halt if a is equal to b now halt takes no arguments um, the halt will execute if a is equal to b otherwise it moves on but you'll notice there is only one blank between the b and the first letter of set which is the next command on the line that's not valid uh, you must have two blanks between them originally all commands in mumps had had line scope they didn't extend to the next line uh, this led to the development of mumps code having extremely long lines where you had nested for loops and um, some very awkward constructions they added a limited amount of block structuring in the 1980s and it's relatively simple but it's a little bit different than most languages first of all they used the do command the do command was originally developed or originally in the language in order to execute remote blocks of code either in the current routine or from a routine that was stored on disk it was a form of subroutine call it was closer to the go sub in basic years ago i don't know if that still exists but anyway that was the do command so that but they changed it and they came up with a form of the do that had no arguments if you have a do with no arguments that tells the interpreter that there are going to be lines of code following this line that should be subject to and belong to the do the do invokes those lines of code and you see the best way is to look at an example here so if I have uh, I've numbered these uh, these lines um, normally there would not be numbering of course in your program first of all we assign um, one to a and then I have an if statement if a is equal to one which of course it is do what the do does is it invokes line three here see the dot in front of line three that means it's a block it means it's a sing it's a first level block the do which was invoked from a zero level block from no block looks for a first level block to execute so what will happen is the if the do will execute this line right and um a is equal to one and so forth and then command will be returned to the do which has no there's nothing further on this line so execution will will jump to line four it skips the block here's a larger example here <coughs> if we set a is equal to one we have the argument um if a is equal to one do and now i have two line two lines here lines three and four uh, write a is equal to one set a equal to a times three um so when line four is finished it returns to uh, returns to the do on line two there's nothing else on the line so it advances it advances to line five when it gets to line five it finds an else statement which by the way there's a missing blank here sometimes they get pulled out by the word processor but there should be two blanks after the after the else anyway we're at line we're at the else now the else is not truly connected to the if um, we should explain something here it's really in the next paragraph but when you when you perform the if it sets a system variable indicating whether or not the the expression in the if was true the the system variable is called dollar sign test now in line two because the it was true that a is equal to one dollar sign test will be set to true that's important because when we get to line five because after the do on line two when we return to the here there's nothing else to do we skip past the block it skips the, past the block on lines three and four and it gets to line five now this is the else the else command checks the contents of dollar sign test if dollar sign test is true the else does not execute if dollar if dollar sign test is false the else does execute 
So since uh, dollar sign test is true, the else on line five will not execute. Therefore, the do will not execute. Therefore, line six and seven will not execute, and we will proceed immediately to line eight. Now, had that not been the case, if the first line had said a is equal to two, and then in line two I said is a equal to one, it no, it's not true. Then the 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 do would not be executed. We would skip the block and we would head for the else on line five. When we get to the else on line five, dollar sign test now would be false, and else's will execute if dollar sign test is false. So the do would be executed, and we would execute also lines six and seven, and then return to line five, nothing else on line five, move to line eight. So th that's an explanation of the else. It really isn't connected directly to an if, it's connected to a system variable. If dollar sign test is false, the else executes. Dollar sign test is true, the else doesn't execute. Dollar sign test is set by if statements. It's also set by other things. Uh, if you open a file and the open fails, dollar sign set test is set to false. If you um, if you attempt to read from a file and the read fails, dollar sign test is set to false. So dollar sign test can be set in a number of ways. One of the obvious ones is, of course, however, the if statement. So um, that's an example. We see actually two blocks here, and they'll alternatively be executed based on what um, what happens uh, based on the on the initial um, if, which set the dollar sign test. Uh, uh, this basically explains in a little better detail here blocks and dollar sign test. As, as I said before, dollar sign test is a system variable. It's set by a lot of different and a lot of different ways. The interesting thing, well, it's not interesting. It's sort of, sort of logical. If you if you have um, blocks uh, blocks uh, can be in, uh, can be Im embedded within blocks. So we have a situation here where we have if a is equal to one, we have a do, and um, let us say a is equal to one. We enter line three and we go to line four and we have another if statement. If b is equal to three, well it isn't, so we don't execute line five. We will um, and since we don't execute line five. Um, we will drop down to line six because that's still at the single level of indent that we're at. And we, there's the two blanks correctly here. Um, we will execute, uh, we will execute the else on line six because B is not equal to three. Therefore, this expression was false. Therefore, dollar sign test was set to false. So when we get to the else, dollar sign test is indeed false. So we do execute line seven. Um, coming out of uh, line seven, we go back up to the do. There's nothing else to be done, so we go on to line eight, and we will. And this writes out dollar sign test. Well, dollar sign test at this point is the is the result of the if on line four. That's been the most recent thing that set dollar sign test. Um, and we write out b, and uh, we will find out, of course, dollar sign test is zero or false. Then we exit. This is the last line of the indented block. That means we go back up to the do, which was on line two. There's nothing else to be done, so we go to line nine. When we get to line nine, dollar sign test is true. It restores the value it had at that level of the program. So the embedded value of dollar sign test, which is false, um, is popped off, and we return to the original value at the at, at, at a no level of indent. Um, that was set by line two, and we'll find out that dollar sign test is uh, true, which is what it got here. The fact that it became false here is lost when we exit the blocks. So dollar sign test is restored when we exit blocks. It's restored to what it was when we uh, prior to entering the block.